Can I just reminisce about the fact that all faculty members post a picture of themselves from 30 years ago and it never changes? Welcome to Hello PhD, a podcast for scientists and the people who love them. Today on the show, we explore some real life data on what postdocs do after their training is done. Stay with us. And we're back. This is Hello PhD, episode 48. I'm Joshua Hall. And I'm Daniel Arneman. And we will discuss the human side of science and life in the lab. Hey, Dan. Hey, Josh. What's happening? We are back. Number 48. Oh, my gosh. We're getting close to the big 50-something mark. Two away from the big 50. All right. Well, we'll keep at it. Um, And in celebration of every episode, we have an ethanol. (laughs) That's right. This, we might have break a record with this one. A record for the most expensive beer... Oh, good. ...that we have consumed so far. Yeah, we, we sit here and trash on all the cheap beers we actually used to drink all the time in grad school, and now you found something that's a new height for expensiveness? But yeah, I mean, it's just all those people clicking through the Amazon banner. Oh, man, we can afford the good stuff now. <laughs> so this beer... Uh, actually, I bought this before we started doing that. But this beer was $12. Dang. And this is like a regular size bottle here. Yeah, and we're splitting it. And we're splitting it because... We're going to save some for tomorrow. I mean, this would be an expensive bottle of wine for me. Yeah, but that, that's <laughs> a lot of money. <laughs> so anyway, this is called the Clouds of Pale Gold Brett Farmhouse Ale from Seattle. And this is from Urban Family Brewing Company. And so, Dan, you might remember, I'm sure you do, last week we had our Lemon Shandy. I have tried to forget and I have been unable to forget. Well, we've gone in the complete opposite direction, although there's a connection. This beer was brewed with Meyer lemons and dandelion greens. Whoa. So we're going to continue the lemon theme. Let's see what a non-Anheuser-Busch lemon-flavored beer tastes like. Yeah. What do you think? Hmm. I'm definitely getting the tartness of the lemons. Yeah, and there's a, you can actually get the, the bitter flavor of the lemon, what is that, the pith? What is the white yeah, part called? Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. You're right. Right on the back of the tongue. Um, Pithy. I noticed that your beer is perfectly clear, <laughs> beautiful yellow color. My beer looks a little cloudier, and there are things floating in it. Now, what happened there, Josh? That was my mistake. Uh, this is a bottle-conditioned beer, meaning that the carbonation came from residual yeast being left in the bottle and then it was capped and sealed, and so and the, then I got the second pour. Is that what happened? Yeah, and so with a bottle conditioned beer, all of that yeast and sediment sinks to the bottom. It's not filtered out, and so I'm sorry, Dan. When I poured your second, you got all the don't be sorry. I think all the a good lot of, stuff. Isn't there vitamin B12 or something? Oh wow, I'm, that really is. <laughs> yeah, it's it's got some <laughs> sizable floaters in it. We we should take a photo of this, Dan. Mine versus yours. This is. Really funny. I see how I stack up. Well, thanks anyway, Josh. Um, it was an expensive beer, so I guess you should enjoy the, the perfectly poured glass of it. <laughs> there you go. Uh, it's not bad. I don't know if it's $12, but it's not bad. Dan, we got an iTunes review. Oh, we love those. Yeah, and I wanted to read this because we love getting those. They really do make our day. All right, this is from C1290. Uh, that's S E A. This is such an amazing show. They address topics that any graduate student can relate to in a way that is super fun. Some stuff is a bit bioscience specific. I'm an engineering grad student, but it is interesting to get that perspective and it is all very relatable. They give great advice and have really wonderful guest speakers. This podcast has changed how I think about my time as a graduate student and my future career. Thank you. That's going to make me cry. I uh, know. What a fantastic comment. That has made my day. That was better than a $12 bottle of beer. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And uh, do please share it around your department, on your listserv, post it to your bulletin board, Facebook, I don't know, wherever people are. Yes, sir. All right, Dan. So we are going to do a little bit of a continuation from our topic last week. Are you going to tell me how many postdocs there are in the world? Because that was the question you left me with, and I still don't know. Well, we got to at least seven. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> Greater than seven postdocs. You know, I think one one issue I had with last week's show was I felt like we we really presented all of these problems, uh, but we didn't really 
you know, really present a lot of hard solutions. We said, hey, we don't know how many postdocs there are. And we should find out. That was People the, should the, find yeah, out. Somebody should do this. <laughs> we don't really know what they do when they leave. Pe- somebody should figure that out. People who aren't us should solve this problem. Well, and, and maybe, though, a little bit on purpose, I was holding back because this week we are actually going to present a study where some people do talk about where their postdocs went. And so this is from a paper that came out very recently. This came out in 2016, May, actually May 6, 2016, so just a, a few weeks ago. A month ago, yeah. Yeah. This was in PLOS Biology, Public Library of Science Biology, and this is called Tracking Career Outcomes for Postdoctoral Scholars, A Call to Action. Ooh, last week's was a call to transparency, I believe, right? So we've moved from transparency so to action. Get and, the phone. It's dominoes. Oh, you know what I think is cool about this sort of one two punch of these two articles is the one we talked about last week. This was in twenty this came out in twenty fifteen. So very early twenty fifteen. You know, they were saying this was from a group of group of postdocs in the Boston area saying, We really need change in this area. We need a little more accountability by universities to figure out who their postdocs are, where they're going. And now here we are in twenty sixteen and we have a major postdoc training institution, this is from UCSF, UC San Francisco, who has done this. They actually did exactly what the paper wanted. Now, did they reference that other paper? Can we prove that they actually read it? Uh, that's a good question. Let's find out. Yeah, Dan, so I see they, they did reference the future of research, which, if you remember, was the symposium and the group organized by these Boston area postdocs. So, obviously, there was some knowledge and maybe some influence from Maybe that they group. were all in touch. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so that's really cool. All right, Dan, so what what they did in this study was they looked at 1,431 postdocs at UCSF who spanned 28 training programs between the years of 2000 and 2013, and these represented postdocs who were in 277 different labs throughout the institution. Okay, that seems like a reasonable sample size if I'm about to learn something about what postdocs do. Yeah. It wasn't wasn't like 12 people who happened to graduate from this one lab or something. No, this was over 1,400. I thought one thing I thought was interesting that wasn't the point of this article, but they said this represented approximately 33% of all the postdocs who had left UCSF in that time period. So there's a lot of postdocs, right? So that means, yeah, there were at least another 2,800 that were unaccounted for. Why didn't they account for them? Well, so one reason, Dan, is or the reason they chose these postdocs is these were all postdocs that were associated with a T32 training grant. Are you familiar with the T32s? So this is a, a training... No, I'm not. Sorry. All right. So this is an NIH training mechanism that many institutions have. T32, you sunk my battleship. <laughs> no, uh, no. So, so these these are special grants that usually are discipline specific that come from the NIH to institutions purely to support trainees, so to support graduate students and postdocs. And, and my feeling is uh, by being associated with these T32s, they're actually is a level of record keeping and accounting that maybe would not exist otherwise. So it was probably... This was, I don't want to say this is the low-hanging fruit. I don't want to undersell what they did here. This is still a sizable sample size. Now, before we get too far into it, is somebody who is part of a T32 grant different, I guess, in a systematic way from the rest of the postdoc population? Are they a certain type of person, a certain type of postdoc that might go on to do a certain career? That is a fantastic question, and that is something we'll get to because it's something they mention in the discussion. Great. I'm just trying to trying to help the science. <laughs> okay. So so they look at these postdocs, and and really they had some pretty simple questions. They wanted to know what the heck did these postdocs do when they left their postdoc? What kind, what kind of job are they doing now? Barnes and Noble. And one thing I thought was interesting was this is what we sort of talked about last week. The way they figured this out was they used LinkedIn. Yeah, they cyberstock. Sweet. Yeah, yeah. They used a little bit of PubMed. So if the postdocs happened to be in academia or publishing papers, they would look in PubMed, look on university websites, but then a lot of it was looking on, on LinkedIn. And so from that, they were able to categorize the types of jobs that these postdocs had. And what they found was that 81% of them were actually in jobs that are typically thought of as PhD-related careers. So these included research and teaching positions that were in academia or research in industry or government. Okay, 81% was the number. 
And this is people in research, teaching, academia, industry, government. Yeah, so kind of the typical jobs we would assume that a PhD would go into. So they're at a university or they're at a research institute or they're in industry or government lab. Okay, okay. so I mean, that's, that's pretty reasonable. Yes. I think 81%. That's 81% better than I that. thought. Uh, 12% were in other science-related careers, so either K-12 through education, communication, policy, regulation, or business development. Okay, that makes... Also, I guess that also makes sense, although um, still a lot of those are education or they're uh, sort of support roles for research. Yeah, right? and these are, all, these are all related to science. And then 4% were actually getting additional training. So I guess these are the real gluttons for punishment. Uh, let's go find those people on LinkedIn and <laughs> make fun of them. Or maybe they decide to go back and do something totally different with their lives. That's true. It's quite possible. It can, it can give you a life-changing experience. I'm living proof. And then there was 1% that was unaccounted for. I guess they were not on LinkedIn. Okay. One thing I thought was interesting, then of those, all right, they divided, they subdivided into U.S. employed postdocs and, and international postdocs. So we're just going to focus on the U.S. employed postdocs for, for a minute. And so they found 37% of the U.S. employed postdocs were actually in faculty positions or positions that were like faculty positions at a research institute or governmental research lab, where maybe they didn't have students, so technically they weren't a faculty member, but they were like a leader of a lab, right? So 37%. And, and this, but I will say this included full-time teaching positions at universities, but these were people with the title professor um, in so, their name. So we did an episode a few weeks ago, a couple episodes with a non-tenure track teaching professor and so she would fall into that category. So she probably would not count as far as this goes because Why these not? were these were people with, uh, you know, associate professor, professor, um, or like a research head. I see. Okay. Um, so, so maybe you'd be at a university that was mostly a teaching university, but you were still a, a faculty member, right? Like a prof associate professor or something like that. And where would you fall in this survey, Josh? Um, you did a I would. Doc. I guess I would be in the other. I guess I'd be in the. Science related career is science Policy, administration, communication, business I development. Guess. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Okay, podcast host. I yeah, that's <laughs> one of the one of the big categories <laughs> unaccounted for. So, so I guess one thing that was interesting was they talked a little bit about that. I guess even still, when they think about the reasons why people go into postdocs, still getting a faculty job is the primary reason people say they want to do a postdoc. Right, and so that's what led them to look at well, how many people were actually getting faculty positions. It was thirty-seven percent. So that's kind of interesting to me that the number one reason people are still doing postdocs is to get faculty positions, but here thirty-seven percent, less than half are actually doing so. And you might think that number seemed kind of high, because you know that we, does seem high. Yeah, we, I mean we've thrown around a lot. A small number get faculty positions. I've heard numbers from nine percent to yeah, maybe it's, it's the 20%. needle in the haystack, right? Uh, but there are a couple things that that the paper brings up. One of those is that this does include full-time teaching positions. Uh, so these aren't just sort of research one faculty positions. But the other thing is, and this is something the paper brings up, is there is a recent study that revealed that between 70 and 85% of career track positions in many disciplines at 10 different universities were filled by alumni from only 25% of the institutions that are out there. So basically there's this elite set of institutions that are filling a disproportionate number of these positions. And and UCSF has got to be up there in the rankings, right? Yeah, so UCSF is actually, at least currently, the number two NIH-funded institution. So this is not, if I look at UCSF's performance in this category, I can't extrapolate that to every other university in the country. Exactly. And that's one of the things that the, the paper brings up, the need for institutions to all do this locally because the needs of their specific postdocs and the career desires for their specific postdocs might differ from university to university. But likely these numbers from UCSF might be elevated and are likely elevated over the national average. The other thing that's a caveat to this, Dan, this goes back to what you were asking, the fact these were all postdocs funded off of a T32 training grant. Right, so the point of these grants is to improve the training of graduate students and postdocs. So you could argue that either there was a selection bias for postdocs who really... I will argue that. Yeah, who had that goal anyway or who were already 
better position to achieve that faculty goal. Or a lot of these T32 training grants provide other training opportunities that aren't available to all trainees. Yeah, and and as you were talking about this, Josh, I was just thinking to myself, we're talking about people who took postdocs at UCSF, fantastic research institution. There's another part of that funnel a little higher up where graduate students are are making transitions and no one's tracking them. And some of them are becoming postdocs. And 80% of those postdocs at UCSF are becoming, you know, researchers in industry or government or academia. But there's got to be a huge number of grad students who don't go on to become postdocs. They go straight to industry mm-hmm. or they go to a totally different career altogether. And so this is really just a, a very finite snapshot of a mm-hmm. particular research institution. I bet you the, the true picture is wildly different. Oh, yeah, absolutely. This is but just, still the best that we have so far. Yeah, this is just one piece of the puzzle. And, you know, I think in an ideal world, every institution, every training institution would do this exact analysis. If from you, from students entering through attrition, through graduation, through the next two steps, three steps in your career, I think. Yeah, and, and you know, the whole goal is not just that institutions will do this analysis and figure out where... And I think what you said is absolutely true, not just where the postdocs are going, where the grad student's going, but then they would make this information easily available publicly to individuals who might want to join that institution for graduate school or for postdoc. Because you can imagine, Dan, if you, let's say, going into grad school, you thought, I want to do industry. Mm -hmm. How nice would it be if part of your decision-making process was you you could look at programs and see, oh, which are the ones where their students tend to be successful in transitioning in industry because maybe there's something about the training there, the opportunities there, or maybe even just the geographical location and proximity to industry connections. Yeah, if I could actually choose my graduate career that would, or graduate training that would fulfill my career goals based on my specific desire, I want to go do policy. Where do I go for that? Oh, here's where people graduate and are able to get policy jobs. Um, I think it'd be wonderful to know in advance. Yeah, absolutely. Here's a here's another piece of data that I wanted to share that I thought was interesting that they did. So they drilled down a little further, and I mentioned there were these 277 different labs that these postdocs came from. So they actually looked at the individual postdoc advisors, and they looked at the ones who had at least 10 postdocs, and then looked at the percent of postdocs getting faculty positions from each of those labs, And there was huge variation. So apparently there was a range from 9% to 93% of postdocs from certain labs getting faculty jobs. So Uh, if if I'm a postdoc and I want a faculty job and I go to this particular lab, I have a 90% chance of getting a faculty job. Or if you go to the lab next door, maybe you have a 9% chance. You have, so you have a 10 times better chance. So is it just coming out of the lab of a Nobel Prize winner or something? I, who knows? They didn't say who the people were. I mean, to me, that is fascinating, right? Yeah, for sure. And I wonder if that's because that that faculty member is great at training postdocs or is very selective or whether just the name recognition carries you to the next step. Or maybe their research is so compelling that uh, you can earn grants and take them with you. Yeah, no, I think I think this is super fascinating. I know... You know, I live in the in the graduate training world, and we think a lot about people think a lot about what makes a successful graduate student, what makes a productive graduate student, and we tend to think about it from the perspective of the student. Like, what is it about the student that makes them successful or not? But we completely ignore the contribution of the research advisor and the role that they might have. And to me, this points uh, this is some pretty compelling evidence that maybe the the influence, positive or negative, of the research mentor on the career outcomes might be pretty significant. Yeah, so if you are a postdoc or searching for a postdoc at UCSF and you want to be a faculty member, go go do the research, figure out which lab you need to join. Yeah, or anywhere. You know, if you know what you want to do, if you want to be a faculty member and you're on the postdoc job search, you better be asking... What's the track record of that? Postdocs from advisor? this lab. Yeah, because yeah, apparently it makes a big a The big answer will difference. be nobody remembers. Which postdocs? We don't know. We didn't keep track. <laughs> well, and so the paper actually, they say, uh, they recommend institutions might consider encouraging faculty to publish their postdoc alumni career outcomes to provide greater transparency to per- prospective postdocs. I've actually seen this on a couple of faculty websites. So you've probably seen, Dan, you might remember when you were researching labs, some faculty... You know, they would have their lab website 
and a lot of them will have the alumni Usually page. updated in the 1990s. <laughs> well, that's the problem, right? There's We decided to make a lab website. It looked great, and then yep. we never touched it again. Dancing hamsters everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it was an era. It was. Um, but I actually have seen some labs do that. They'll post their alumni and where they are now, and that that's really helpful. But wouldn't it be neat if that was a, a requirement or at least strongly encouraged? Can I just reminisce about the fact that all faculty members post a picture of themselves from 30 years ago <laughs> and it never changes. I remember being so shocked my first graduate school interview and it was my first interview of the day. And, you know, I had, because it was my first interview, I'd done my research. I'd looked up all the faculty and I'd done, looked at some papers and you know, done all this work. So I had this picture in my mind of what this lady looked like. <laughs> and then I walked into her office and I had this moment of shock because she looked nothing like... She's just a head in a jar at that point. <laughs> I was like... Wait, are you the mom of the... <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. But yeah, no, you're totally right. Yeah, maybe that should be a new requirement is you have to update your photo every five years. Yeah, my LinkedIn photo is from 10 years ago, <laughs> so I can't, I can't say anything about it. All right, Dan. So one thing that I thought was interesting from this analysis was the, the one thing that they didn't uncover is there's not a lot of unemployed postdocs, right? So it seems That's like... something good. Yeah, right? It's not like, and 25% were unemployed. I yeah, mean, had left the workforce or something. I mean, 91% were in science-related positions. From UCSF. From UCSF, okay. right. You know, to me, that speaks a little bit to the fact, and this is, was from the Francis Collins quote last week, that he did not see any evidence that we were training too many people, that we were over-meeting the needs of, of, you know, the jobs that are out there. You know, maybe this is true, uh, but one of the things I would want to know is of those 93% of postdocs who are in science-related careers, only 37% of them had these professor-type jobs. That other 56% not in faculty positions, are they disappointed not to be in those positions, or did they choose something else? Great question. Are they, are they sad every day that they just yeah. didn't get that faculty job? Because to me, that is the most important question. Of if we want to know, you know, are we training too many people? Is there a problem here? Because to me, if the answer is, you know, the vast majority of postdocs actually are getting fulfilling careers, it's just they're not faculty. Who cares? Like, I don't care if they're not faculty. As long, like, I'm not a faculty member, but I chose not to be. However, if there are all these people going into postdocs wanting to be faculty, and by default they feel like they have to settle for something else because they couldn't get the job they wanted, then maybe that's a problem. And I think, I think the other big thing is, and this was one thing the paper brought up that I think is, is true. And I want, I want to read this quote. They say, We posit that postdocs participate in a system that evolved many decades ago in which they receive mentoring intended to prepare them for independent academic research careers in exchange for providing labor, producing data, writing manuscripts, preparing grant applications. We believe this model disproportionately benefits those postdocs who move into faculty positions. I fully agree. You know, I love the notion of an apprenticeship where you get to do the thing, you are trained in the career that you're going to have by somebody who is more senior. And for a postdoc who wants to become a faculty member, I think the system works. For a postdoc that wants to go on to industry, it probably doesn't work. Or for somebody who just loves science and wants to bring a scientific approach to some other career, uh, this is not the training you need. Yeah, and, and maybe... And maybe that is part of the problem, because I think we have seen, you know, maybe postdocs are getting jobs, and that's great. But we've also seen the length of time people are having to do postdocs increasing. And you're right, if functionally this postdoc position is still an apprenticeship for a faculty position, but the majority of postdocs aren't going into faculty positions, is it a waste of time? Like, would it be possible, or would it be possible to maybe improve or change the model of what a postdoc does depending on their career objectives. Yeah, I think it makes it makes so much sense. And, you know, we talk about how um, there's this call for more STEM training. And I think if you look at it from the standpoint of we need more people who are uh, trained in science, who think scientifically, who understand engineering and math, um, that is a true statement. And I think we have to release these people from the notion that they're going on to academic faculty positions and say, I want scientifically trained marketing people. I want scientifically trained psychologists. And I want scientifically trained, um, you know, bus drivers. I don't know what all the different jobs are that people need to be trained in. But, but certainly in business, there is a lack of methodical 
planning and a methodical approach to solving problems. And I think you do learn that in lab. So um, there's my call for more STEM training. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I was at a conference. This was years ago now, and Bruce Alberts. You heard of Bruce Alberts? He's the mm-hmm. I think he's the editor of the Molecular Biology of the Cell book, and he. He's a scientist, and he's also done some policy stuff in Washington, D.C., some advisement. But that's exactly what he was talking about, is the need for scientific thinking, the need for scientists in segments of our population other than just the lab. Yep. People are making business decisions every day, and they're taking the the surface evidence. They get one piece of information and they say, we're going to run in this direction. And they're not thinking about, well, how did that information come to me? And is it possible that that is biased in some way? And do I need to have a control that tells me that these two things are really different? The notion that we should be thinking in a scientific way, I think you can't argue with it. Yeah. And you know what? You probably, you probably don't need a postdoc to get there. You sure don't. In fact, you should spend your time learning business if you want to go into business Um, You should learn marketing if you want to go into marketing, and you will be a rock star in that field because you have this background. I think maybe what we're getting towards is is something I I tell a lot of students, and that is when you're nearing the end of graduate school, make sure, if at all possible, you don't do a postdoc by default. Do a postdoc because it will help you get to where you want to go. Excellent advice, and it can't be repeated too often. If you are looking down the barrel of a postdoc, you're about to graduate Um, start yesterday, start today, whenever you can uh, to start thinking about what career step you will take next. Yeah, and kudos to the folks at UCSF for actually taking the time to not only figure out where their postdocs are going, but to make this information publicly available. And I hope more institutions fall in their footsteps. Episode 48 would have been really dull without it. (laughs) That's right. Episode 49, a different institution posts their data. We'll get to it, I'm sure. All right, Dan. So... I've actually been on the edge of my seat because I wanted to know about part two of the the etymology dung series. Okay, well, it's, it's going to end with part two. The Tom Life dung series. The Tom Life dung series. <laughs> so the clue last week was, this dung is hard as a rock. In fact, it's a fossil. Now, have you ever heard of fossilized dung? I feel like that clue is a little bit gross. Dinosaur poop? No? Nothing? You know, I think you got me on this one. Okay, well, in the geological world, this is called a coprolite. So they're actually fossilized uh, animal dung from whatever era, and the you know the the dung gets mineralized and and it lasts forever. I guess you can actually dig this up and learn something about the animal. I thought it was really fascinating that this is distinct from something called paleo feces, mm. um, which is is that what if you're on a paleo diet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's not. <laughs> the waste that you produce when on the paleo diet is paleo feces. That is also paleo feces, <laughs> I guess, technically. But paleo feces is not mineralized. It retains a lot of its original organic composition. So you can learn something about what that animal ate, I guess, or that person. It's a fine there. line. So I hope you enjoyed this dung series. Um, copro is the, the root from, uh, I think it originally comes from the Greek, and that means dung. And then the light part is from lithos. So if you can have a lithograph or whatever, that means stone. So uh, hard as a rock, dung is hard as a rock. That is copper light. So light and stone come from the same uh, word origin? Lith. So L-I-T-H. Lithos, light. Mm. Those are, that means stone in the Greek. Gotcha. So look for that. Um, I will not make you come up with the word coprophagy which means dung Ooh. eating. Yeah. So that was actually how I got here from Scarab Beetle eventually. Uh, I figured I couldn't come up with a clue that would lead somebody oh, to they are Because they are dung eating. They certainly yeah. are. That's right. All right, Dan. We had a winner this week. It was Michael from the University of Florida. And Michael is a math PhD student, which is cool. And he said he knew the answer because dinosaur class finally paid off. So... Thanks for playing, Michael, and thanks for staying awake during dino class. All right, Dan, what do you have for us this week? Hopefully something a little less dung related. (laughs) hope so. So This week's clue is a summertime clue. This unpleasant mosquito has white painted stripes and can transmit viral pathogens like Zika, chikungunya, and dengue. 
read it one more time, this unpleasant mosquito has white painted stripes and can transmit viral pathogens like Zika, chikungunya, and dengue. And I'm looking for the genus and species of this particular mosquito. So if you think you know the answer, send an email to puzzle at hellophd.com and I will randomly select a winner from all the correct responses and send the lucky puzzler an Amazon gift card. Fantastic. Another entomology etymology. Oh, I love them. Man. We're trying to do more of those. Hey, Dan, we have had some great discussion this last couple of episodes on some studies we saw. If you're out there and you read something interesting that you think would be cool to discuss on the show, or you know what, if you've just been dealing with something in the lab that you want to get an opinion on or you just want to discuss, we would love to hear it. We do this week after week and we get tired of coming up with stuff. And And you get tired of listening to it. (laughs) That's true. Uh, So if you're tired of what we're talking about, we would love to have your suggestions. You can email us podcast at hellophd.com and we love getting your tweets too you can send us a tweet at hellophd we have a facebook page you can find us by general searching strategies <laughs> and we would we'd love to hear from you also you can leave us a review on itunes we love to read those on the show as we demonstrated today that's fantastic and you know what else is fantastic josh i liked this beer this was a good beer i feel like I had nah, to redeem. Not, maybe not twelve dollars beer, but but I really enjoyed the the kind of complex flavor on this one. I have to ask, did you did you pick up the dandelion greens? No, I think I got more lemon rind, but but it was still tasted good, and I think I left the the kind of floaty bits at the bottom of the glass, so I'm I'm all right. Would you even know what dandelion greens taste like? I tasted a dandelion green a couple weeks ago. How was Actually, it? Actually, just last week, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it is intensely, intensely bitter. Maybe I, that's where the bitter came from. I went out into the lawn, I picked a dandelion green, because I read that they tasted bitter, and it was bitter for hours after I ate it. So maybe it wasn't the pith, maybe it was the dandelion green. Could have been the herbicide, too, I don't know. <laughs> Ooh, I can really pick up the Roundup flavor. Yeah, it's delicious. <laughs> All right, Dan, we will be back at you again next week with some more Hello PhD. We'll see you next week. Bye.